Honestly, I'm on stage a lot, but I feel completely out of my element right now. I'm just gonna be vulnerable with you right here. Uh, I'm not a professor or a, a physicist or a founder or expert at anything like most of the other speakers you're gonna hear today. Uh, in fact, I barely graduated with a bachelor's degree. Uh, last week, I had a recurring stress stream about a surprise midterm. I am 34 years old. <laughs> Something is terribly wrong. <laughs> Uh, something's always been kind of wrong in my head. I, I felt that all my life. I think that's why I talk so much, because I'm always like, I'm desperately trying to process what I'm experiencing out loud. Uh, when I was young, I talked so much. My grandmother predicted that I would be a preacher. Uh, my mom predicted that I would be a lawyer. I ended up becoming a comedian. My entire family immigrated from Korea just so that one day, me, Peter Sunmin Kim, would get paid with free beers. <laughs> Domestic ones only. Um, <laughs> I, I used to get paid real money for, uh, to perform at the Second City, but I left last October, and now um, I'm really regretting it because <laughs> health insurance is dope as hell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't always a comedian. Uh, before that, I was a small business owner. And uh, before that, I worked as, uh, f at Yahoo as a data strategist, which is just a fancy term for overpaid spreadsheet guy. Uh, <laughs> eight years ago, I found comedy at the lowest point in my life. Uh, I, I, in that way, I feel like comedy and church is for the same types of broken people. Uh, you never hear a well-adjusted person say, mm, I'm gonna take an improv class today. <laughs> Honestly, uh, I found comedy way before 2009. Uh, as a chubby, closeted, gay Korean boy raised by fundamental Christian, uh, Christian immigrants, I often felt uh, very vulnerable in my life and uh, within a deficit of power. But at an early age, I learned that comedy uh, was a tool I could employ to feel a sense of control over the chaos. Gilda Radner, as you guys all know, SNL alum, uh, original member, so poignantly once said, you feel completely in control when you hear a wave of laughter coming back at you that you have caused. The power of comedy comes from embracing the difficult truths about ourselves and our world in the least painful way possible. It's knowing that uh, Wiley Coyote will survive the devastating fall off yet another cliff. Uh, it's a sense of safety. I first learned about this guy, Abraham Maslow, in Psych 101, a class I almost failed due to a super cute period in my life. <laughs> I was drinking a lot because uh, I, I just didn't understand how to process freedom. And uh, this period is when that stress stream is from, by the way. Uh, Maslow, if I'm remembering correctly, was an American psychologist from the 40s who explained human behavior through motivation. Uh, being from a culty, fundamental Christian background, I've always been obsessed with two things. First thing, figuring out why we do what we do. And the second thing, the Christian rock band Jars of Clay. They really rocked. <laughs> uh, Maslow's uh, iconic hierarchy of needs explains how we, have, uh, how we behave based on meeting certain needs in different levels, uh, like basic physiological needs, to safety, to belonging, to esteem, and to the highest level self-actualization. My first experience with comedy came from this, uh, th this basic level of safety. I grew up in Flushing, Queens with cousins, aunts, and uncles all living on top of each other in the same apartment building. Uh, like most old world Koreans, my family was very stoic, never showed any emotions, much less talked about them. And that was really difficult for me because as I mentioned before, I just love to talk, talk, talk. And uh, when I left for college, I forced my mom to hug me and it's the most awkward thing we've ever done. My dad, on the other hand, was a very expressive man, uh, but he only had two speeds, 
funny, and hot Korean rage. Uh, he was like your classic alcoholic, abusive father, but he never drank alcohol. Instead, he drank self-pity and shade. <laughs> Has anyone in here read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking? Yes? Okay. Uh, great. I don't read because it makes me sleepy, and <laughs> I think there are more efficient ways to process information. <laughs> uh, so I listened to his audiobook. Uh, <laughs> his voice is very soothing. Um, but anyway, in his book, he writes about what I knew instinctively as a young child, that when you grow up with an abusive parent, you learn to quickly read the situation. And uh, whether it's the tension in the room or the micro expressions on your father's face, you have to be ready to pivot and find safety at any given moment. I got so good at reading my father's explosive rage split seconds before he even felt them. When he got angry, his eyes were narrow, his upper lips curled, and he showed his teeth. And this was the cue for me to make a funny face or say something non sequitur, purposefully lowering my status to play the fool to his king. I automatically injected status into my father, and through practice, I became an expert at flipping the status in order to temporarily find safety. Now, safety is an integral part of why we laugh. If we don't assume the safety of the individual uh, subject that's being laughed at, it's difficult for us to enjoy their failure. When people shout the phrase, too soon, it's an audience's way of saying, I don't feel safe with this joke. Safety is the key factor in the old adage, comedy equals tragedy plus time. We are assuming that time healed all wounds and that we have fully processed the tragedy, providing us a safe and distanced perspective, allowing us to laugh. My father passed away in 2014, uh, many, many years after we stopped speaking. When he died, my mom called me on the phone and said, Peter, you have to go to his funeral. And I was like, no, I'm not going, I don't, what? You go to his funeral. And she was like, no, you go to his funeral. It's like, what are we doing? <laughs> uh, I hated this guy. We hated this guy. Why should I go to his funeral? And she said, you have to go to his funeral and make sure he's dead. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> because you laughed, it's easier for you to accept what's happened. And we can all move on. Because you assume that I have as well. We collectively just experienced a moment of vulnerability and powerlessness, but with a joke, we have regained status quo. We have returned to homeostasis. We are safe again. Once we have achieved basic safety, we can move on to the next stage, belonging. I was an angry little closeted gay boy who obsessively read fantasy books and thought I was smarter than everyone else. So making friends that weren't my first cousins was impossible. It didn't help that I played Advanced Dungeons and Dragons and made sure everyone knew that it was advanced. Nobody ever asked. Uh, my family was like 80s immigrant poor, which meant that our fridge consisted of spam, kimchi, and a block of half-hardened government cheese. With two working parents and no money for nannies, at a young age I was left home alone with a basic television package and a keyboard I got for my birthday after explicitly asking for a Nintendo Entertainment System. <laughs> my mom would be like, you can make money as a pianist, there's no money in gaming. How wrong she is now. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time watching cartoons and eating spicy cheesy spam and got really, really fat. Uh, like my nipples exploded <laughs> and I developed asthma and my pediatrician looked at my cholesterol levels uh, and said I was no longer sexy. <laughs> In middle school, uh, middle school was like a blurry mess for me. All I remember is a basement party where I did not kiss anyone, boys to men, and a slam book uh, a la Mean Girls and it, it was the meanest things that I've ever read or wrote. And uh, <laughs> by then my nipples became puffy and I developed like a humble A cup. And <laughs> like in middle school, girls were like playing with their boobs because they were like, oh, I want to make my boobs bigger. And I was like furiously doing push-ups to make them go away. Uh, it did not help that I was also eating push-ups, uh, 
which is that old school Flintstones push up, like push pop ice cream. Anyway, they're delicious and you can find them at bodegas in Pilsen. <laughs> uh, a few years after that, uh, I went to the Bronx High School of Science, a school so nerdy that it was 40% Asian Americans. And uh, like most subcultures, the Asians in my school banded together to propagate social hierarchies, provide protection, and eventually friendship in exchange for mass humiliation. And these weren't the Asians I was used to, like those church Asians and Asians I saw on TV, like Mickey Rooney. Uh, <laughs> this was a new breed of Asians. These, like, I had never seen these type of Asians before. They were leather jacket wearing, shaved head, long banged, Tokyo drifting Asians. And they, they were smart, they were cool, uh, and they were a little dangerous. And all I ever wanted was to just burst out into a choreographed k pig pop dance with them. On the first snowfall, the seniors herded the freshmen up to a hill called Harris Field and lined us up. One by one, they stepped up, stepped up and lied down on their backs uh, and in front of two seniors who would grab the kids' arms and legs respectively and then roll them down the hill. But when I stepped up, the seniors took one look at my pudgy pubescent body and said, you are too fat, roll yourself down the hill. I was crushed. I looked around at the other freshmen at, who avoided my gaze. Uh, none of them dared to stand up for me and I felt completely powerless. So I did the only thing I knew to do to make them laugh. I tucked my head in between my legs and rolled head first down the hill like a complete maniac. Like I looked like that kid, Thudbutt, the, the character in Hook, the little chubby black kid. You guys, you guys know what I'm talking about? And it would go, Hook is a great movie. Um, <laughs> the entire hill erupted with laughter. Everyone started pointing and cheering. Uh, one of the other freshmen came up to me still laughing and said, that was the funniest thing I have ever seen. And after that day, we became inseparable best friends until we went to separate colleges and now we no longer talk. And I'm off Facebook, so he could be dead. Um, I just don't know. <laughs> uh, that first week of high school, I got to flip the status once again and controlled when people laughed at me and what they laughed at. I assumed their point of view about me, and instead of fighting it, I played into it. I think this is when I started to figure out that what it meant, means to have confidence and self-worth. I give uh, The self-worth is something I give myself versus what I allow others to play with. Someone's thoughts about you is entirely about them. A reliance on self-worth is what I felt change in me in high school that made other kids not only feel comfortable being around me, uh, but made them feel good about themselves. See, that is the power of comedy. It's like a magic trick. It's the act of confidence amidst fear. Uh, by leaning into your faults and vulnerabilities, you are back in control. Esteem, the next level. Well, this is a tough one. Uh, most of us get stuck here. I'm still stuck here. Like today, in my head, I'm thinking, what if this talk goes wrong? Uh, what if you think I'm a fraud? What if I'm not funny enough? What if I'm too funny and the message gets lost? Why do you even need a message? Because it's a TEDx, hello. I'm sorry you had to see that. Um, <laughs> that's going through my head right now. And um, ideally, esteem is generated from self-esteem or validating your own self-worth. But how do you love and respect yourself when you have no idea who you are? I grew up in a Korean church, uh, one that never shamed homosexuality because its existence was categorically denied. When I was 10, I asked my mom if there were gay people in Korea, and she responded with, absolutely not. There are no gays in Korea. Okay, maybe there are a few, but they're all Japanese. <laughs> and I was like, well, konnichiwa, mother. Um, <laughs> I wish that's what I said, I really do, uh, but <laughs> that would have been so smart and precocious. Um, the truth is, because it took me so long to find safety in my home and um, belonging within a group of friends, I was afraid of revealing my truth uh, and I thought that that would cause everything to just tumble down like a house of cards. 
What I know now is that all of that wasn't real anyway. All that good Maslow work that I had done uh, was built on a faulty foundation, uh, a house built on sand instead of rock. I had never truly found a sense of safety, a sense of home, so when given the opportunity to, to start over, I took it. In 2007, I moved to San Francisco with a six-figure job at Yahoo modeling people's be uh, browsing behavior. <laughs> it was the creepiest thing I've ever done, and I regret leaving because I missed that 401k match. <laughs> I was young, successful, and finally rich. It felt good to be rich. Like I bought lattes and left like a dollar or two dollars in the tip jar. I was like completely reckless. <laughs> the trajectory of my external life was clear as day. It was get promoted, become a VP, buy a house, find a Korean wife, have Korean kids, move my mother in to be the live-in nanny slash grandma. I mean, the Korean-American gold standard of success. But inside, I was a blurry and unrecognizable mess. I was a shell of a person, my light being slowly extinguished every time I suffered through a college football game or a clumsily fumbled around lady parts. I was desperate to come out of the closet, but was terrified about what my mom would say, how my dad would react, but mostly I was terrified to come out to myself. The first few months in San Francisco was the loneliest I ever felt. I cried a lot in my obscenely expensive studio apartment. Uh, one day a friend of mine asked me to go to a stand-up comedy show, and at the end the host mentioned that they taught classes. And I, just, I decided, what the hell, what do I have to lose? Um, it turns out that I had everything to lose uh, and one thing to gain, me. You know how everyone loves a funny person, but we all hate that person who's like trying to be funny? That was me. <laughs> uh, my first ever stand-up set, I wrote three minutes of jokes about how different types of liquor affect you differently. I mean, just really in lines work. <laughs> and they hated every single second of it. I hated myself. But each bombing led me to what I knew since I was a young boy, uh, to speak the truth in the exact right way at the exact right time. So I decided to finally come out to a scattered audience of random open micers at the back of a laundromat, you know, how I always dreamed of doing it. <laughs> Not one person batted an eyelash. The truth I was so ashamed of, the demon that I kept unnamed and caged, that kept me powerless, was finally free. So I came out over and over and over again, everywhere I could, anyone that would listen, from audiences, at comedy shows, to baristas, at trendy coffee shops, I'd be like, I'm gay, and the barista would be like, we're in San Francisco, get over it. I made jokes about being in the closet and my repressive upbringing. People nodded, people laughed. Some people even came up to me afterwards and said, you're very brave, thank you. And after lying to myself for so long and feeling like a coward, I did finally feel brave. I felt powerful. The act of comedy for me was to live my truth in the face of its vulnerability. Comedy forces us to reckon with the truths about ourselves and our world that we are too afraid to approach. It forces perspective on the things that we feel oppressed by. Comedy empowered me to come out to my friends and family back in New York and start a theater in San Francisco called Endgames, uh, which is just a nominal homage to the journey towards my own personal endgame of living an unapologetically honest life. In 2012, at age 30, I left San Francisco. Uh, I left my career in Silicon Valley, my theater uh, and games, and armed with a tiny bit of savings, I decided to throw all that away and pursue comedy full time, giving my mother yet another small aneurysm. And since then, I've been lucky enough to perform on the road. Uh, making strangers laugh all across the country. And here in Chicago, uh, I helped create a critically acclaimed review at the Second City which I decided to leave last year. So I am unemployed again, I am poor again, and unsure of what my future holds. 
But while the road ahead of me is a complete blur, I've never been more clear on the inside. As for self-actualization, now apparently Maslow believed that only 2% of people achieve this anyway, so my mother will be expecting an A+. Plus. And, um, <laughs> but honestly, that seems like a lot of work to me. And I'm just looking to like really feel good about myself and marry rich. So, um, <laughs> so here's what I would say to you. If there are truths in your life that threaten to dull your inner presence, try making fun of it first. It might just give you the distance that you need to lead a more powerful life. Thank you.